that today, Jason. So um, I um, have just finished watching all the Proctor Hub videos. I can't release the grades until I watch all the videos. That's the problem, right? So I just finished watching all the videos and um, I have a few emails to send out based on some discrepancies in the videos. Um, once I hear back from those students and meet with them, I'll be able to um, release the grades. So with any luck, they will um, reply to me soon and I can release the grades by tomorrow for sure. So um, what will be really helpful for me is if when you guys are taking the test, you make sure that you are in full screen, right? Um, I don't want to be seeing your roof and a little bit of you because that serves me zero purpose. Your roof is not taking the test. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, try to make sure that you're in the full screen. Um, make sure the lighting is good. I mean, if you're sitting in the dark, I mean, I don't understand why we have this video because you're in the dark. I can't see you. <laughs> right. So you have to make sure that, you know, there's good enough lighting. Um, I can actually see you. And then another Another thing you want to make sure that you do is keep your eyes on the screen. When you start looking away from the screen, then I have to like rewatch the video, try to figure out what's going on. And if it looks like something that's, you know, not kosher, then I have to send you an email and we have to talk about it. So it's really important that you guys, you know, help me out here because the more you help me out, the quicker I can release the exam grades, right? So really just you know when you guys are taking the test make sure you're you're looking at the screen i'm not entirely sure what else you could be looking at so keep your eyes on the screen keep your eyes on the test um and make sure that you yourself are in focus because if i'm seeing your roof uh your ceiling and i'm not seeing you then what's the point of the video you know what i'm saying guys so um it's really important that you have you know good video etiquette when you are taking the test okay um so i'm in the process of sending out those emails now i've already spoken with some students so it's just a matter of wrapping everything up all right and then i'll be able to release the grades uh any other questions you like the average of this exam let me see if I can look at the average of this exam. Hold on. Uh, this is path 02. You will definitely be able to go over the exam, right? You just need to set up a meeting with me. So set up an appointment with me and we can go over the exam. So, you know, the one thing that's actually good for you guys in the pandemic and being online, even though being online sucks for the most part for you guys, um, is that I when you go over the exams, I'm doing them one-on-one, -on -one, right? On a regular day, if we were taking this class um, on campus, it would be like one big Corona Fest in my office, you know, 10 students at a time with a really, really long line, you know, and we're going over it as a group. But because I know, you know, things are hard for you guys in the, you know, doing things online, you're stressed out, blah, 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 blah. I'm trying to make sure that, you know, when I meet with students and go over the exams, I'm doing a one-on-one. -on -one. So you have to set up an appointment with me which also lends me to tell you that if you are going to um try if you're going to review the exam one with me make sure you ex review it before exam two is given because it's, it would be it's very difficult for me i have 400 students or more to be one on one and doing exam one and two at the same time or exam one two and three at the same time so once exam one is done I mean, once exam two is done, we're done reviewing exam one. So the average score for this class was 75% and the high score was 100. So someone in here made 100. Yay, you. Um, actually, I feel like this is a class that had two people make 100, if I'm not mistaken, when I looked at the exams. Um, and the average score was 75. So you guys did pretty good, actually when you think about it. And I'm looking at the quiz stats and I see a really nice bell curve here. Most people made like in the B's section. You, obviously, you're a pretty big deal, my friend. <laughs> I would have to agree, you know, got some good high scores going on over here. Okay, so that's good to know. Okay, um, let's see. We have the endocrine 
chap um, unit coming up, and this is, you know, a, a really fun unit. The GI unit, it's cool, you know, it's a lot of information, but it's cool. But the endocrine unit is, is, is pretty neat. And if we really understand endocrine physiology, I truly believe that this chapter is going to be, I mean, this unit is going to be one of those units where it will flow um, very well for you. So unit one is a big unit. It's a monster of a unit. So we've kind of gotten that out of the way, which just kind of lends us to... Um, to uh, kind of uh, not such a scary unit anymore. Uh, so any other questions before we start? Awesome. Okay, well, you guys know if you have questions, you can always drop them in the chat or tell me in the chat that you want to take the mic. I'm okay with either. So what I wanted to do with you guys today is make through as much as chapter 39 as possible. Um, we should be able to get through the majority of it today because I know your chapter 39 quiz is um, will be closing this week. So my advice to you with the endocrine unit is to really understand what the endocrine glands and hormones do, which is pretty much chapter 39. Because if you really think about it, critical thinking skills, which... I must say, um, I know I kind of force you to utilize in this class, you know, um, your critical thinking skills will really get you through this unit um, if you understand the physiology of the endocrine system. So for example, if you know what a hormone does, if you don't have enough of that hormone, you can pretty much make up your mind what's going to happen, right? Or if you have too much of that hormone acting, if you know what the hormone originally does, then you can kind of think about, hey, if I've got too much of it, it must mean this, right? So, you know, understanding the physiology of the endocrine system, I think is going to be the key to this unit. So just to kind of give you guys a reminder of the endocrine system, because I know you did it in physiology already, but, um, you know, when you think of the endocrine system, you're really thinking of an organ system that is either a group of cells or specific organs that are specialized to make and secrete hormones. And hormones are these chemicals that are actually um, traveling through the blood that act on target cells. Now, the one thing that you need to always remember is that a hormone doesn't make a cell do something it didn't do before. A hormone is really just altering the activity of the cell. So that cell was doing it thing and then the hormone came along and altered the activity either increased or decreased the activity of the cell itself okay so to me i feel like this is the best way to get through the unit right i mean this is how i teach the units because i feel like this is a comfortable way to make it through the unit and um, kind of like a systematic way that makes it very understandable so no matter what hormone we go through, no matter what gland we are learning about in the endocrine system, if you kind of use this flow chart um, or this kind of systematic flow, it, everything begins to make sense, all right? So the first thing you need to always ask yourself is what is the gland that you're focusing on? Then you need to ask yourself what is triggering that gland to secrete? And then when it does secrete, what does it secrete and where is it going? And when it gets there, what does it do? So for example, let's pretend this is the thyroid, right? If this is the thyroid gland, right? We need to ask ourselves, what triggers the thyroid gland to secrete? Well, that would be a hormone known as thyroid stimulating hormone or TSH. TSH travels to the thyroid binds to the receptors on the thyroid epithelium, triggers the thyroid to make and secrete hormones known as T3 and T4. Those hormones travel to pretty much every cell in the body and increase your overall basal metabolic rate. Does that flow kind of make sense, guys? So this tells us that if we have an increase in TSH, that's going to cause for the thyroid gland to be increasing its activity of synthesizing and secreting T3 and T4, which also means that the more T3, T4 is released, 
the more travels to our target cells and the more we increase our overall basal metabolic rate. So what does it mean, basal metabolic rate? Well, you know, basic metabolism. So if you are increasing the basal metabolic rate and it's to the point where it's overexpressed or too much, then things that are going to start happening would be, for example, you start feeling hot all the time, you know, you um, are losing weight, even though, you know, you're eating food, maybe you're sweating, right? Um, it's kind of like the activity of a hyperactive person that would be occurring in that particular case, right? So the thyroid is the example, yes. The same would hold true in the opposite. Let's say, for example, you don't release enough thyroid stimulating hormone. That means I don't have enough hormone to trigger the thyroid, which means the thyroid won't be releasing enough T3, T4, which means that it can't act on your cells to increase the basal metabolic rate, which means that person will have very slow or low metabolic activity which means that even if they're not eating, they're still going to gain weight. They're going to be cold all the time because their metabolism is slow, right? Um, does that kind of make sense, guys? Yes. So that's how I want you to be thinking about it because it just makes it a little bit easier to understand. So whether this is the adrenal gland or the thyroid or the pituitary, no matter what gland is the one you're focusing on, always know that there is something that's going to be acting upon it, right? To trigger its ability to synthesize and secrete, then it's going to secrete a particular product. That product, that product is going to go somewhere. It's going to have a target. And when it gets there, it's going to do something. So does that kind of make sense, guys? So that's how you really want to think about it. So overall, you need to be thinking to yourself, what is making that gland actually secrete? Like, what is the trigger? Because we already said that there is a gland and something triggers it. And then when it's triggered, it releases a particular product. So what's that trigger? Well, it could be another hormone. So in the case that we just did a while ago, which was the thyroid, well, TSH was a hormone that triggered the thyroid to release T4, right? So in that particular case, a hormone stimulated another hormone to be released. Does that make sense, guys? But it could be something in the humoral fluid. So for example, what about glucose in the blood? So, you know, let's say your birthday is coming up, right? And you decide to bake a cake. And then you decide to eat the entire cake. This is my plan, right? When you eat the entire cake, what happens? Your blood glucose levels rise that rise in the blood glucose is going to trigger your pancreas to release insulin. Insulin will then travel to your cells and have the GLUT4 receptor take up excess glucose out of the blood, put it into the cells. Job done, right? But in that case, a hormone didn't stimulate the pancreas to release insulin as a hormone. What actually stimulated it was your glucose levels in the blood. Does that kind of make sense, guys? So in this case, it's not a hormone that stimulates it, but the actual protein or ion or glucose or whatever that's found within the actual humoral fluid. Another example of something that could trigger it would be the nervous system. So for example, you have an adrenal gland. That adrenal gland has something called an adrenal medulla, which is basically like a little knot of sympathetic nervous tissue. So your sympathetic nervous system triggers your adrenal medulla to release epinephrine and norepinephrine. In this case, it wasn't a hormone that stimulated the adrenal gland, right? It wasn't humoral fluid or it wasn't proteins in the fluid or ions in the fluid that triggered the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine. In this case, it was the actual nervous system that triggered the release. Does that kind of make sense, guys? So when you're thinking about, you know, the flow of everything, always say to yourself, what is my gland that I'm focusing on? What is triggering it to secrete, right? When it secretes that product, what is that product? Where is it going? And when it gets there, what does it do? So to answer Dan's question, the humoral fluid is basically your plasma. What's in the blood? Yeah, no problem. Okay. 
So we are focusing on endocrine glands in this particular unit, right? So we did a lot of exocrine gland function when we did the GI tract, but the endocrine glands are what we're really focusing on here in, um, in this unit. And there are so many different endocrine glands or even cells within particular organs that act as endocrine glands. So overall, when you guys are thinking about the endocrine system, what you're thinking about is this control system of the body. It's the second great control system of the body. Of course, your nervous system is the first great control, um, control system of the body. When you think about the nervous system, pretty much everything acts quickly, it acts in like milliseconds. But the endocrine system, when it acts, it acts via hormones. And these hormones have to travel through the blood. So sometimes it may take seconds for them to act, but sometimes it can even take days. So for example, you know, growth hormone may take a few days to act, you know, so it really just depends on the actual hormone and where it's going and what the target is. But overall, when we're thinking about hormones, you know, they have very important roles in the body. You know, they do things like control growth and development, reproduction, they control um, like the balance of the electrolytes in the body, the nutrient balance in the blood, um, they regulate energy balance. Like, you know, we talk about the thyroid just now, it regulates, you know, your basal metabolic rate and they're constantly regulating all of these processes. Now, the way how they act is through, an, um, mostly through negative feedback, right? So when you're thinking about negative feedback and positive feedback, just to kind of remind you guys how this works, a negative feedback system is how most of your homeostatic mechanisms are controlled, right? So the idea with negative feedback is there is some kind of stimuli, a change is occurring, then negative feedback kicks in and that output basically is going to either shut off the original stimuli or reduce the intensity of the original stimuli. So for example, you eat birthday cake, your blood glucose rises, insulin is triggered to be released. When insulin is released, the blood glucose is taken out of the blood and the glucose is stored in the cells. The glucose levels in the blood falls, bringing us back to a balance, homeostasis. That's an example of negative feedback. An example of positive feedback would be you have some type of stimuli, it causes a change, and the result of that change is basically enhanced. So oxytocin is a perfect example. When oxytocin is released, it's released because the cervix is dilated. When it's released, it makes the cervix dilate even more. And the more the cervix dilates, the more oxytocin is triggered to release to the point where oxytocin is released continuously dilating the cervix on the, until it gets to about 10 centimeters where you can have the baby. Okay, so a negative feedback mechanism is how we basically shut off the original stimuli or reduce the intensity of the original stimuli, which is how most homeostatic mechanisms work and how more most hormones will act. Um, and then positive feedback is usually trying to enhance your original stimuli. Does that kind of make sense, guys? Yeah. So another thing to think about is where these hormones are going and how it's going to get there, right? So hormones are traveling through the blood, okay? So when they travel through the blood, the only way they really are able to recognize their target is if there are receptors on the target themselves, okay? So the idea is that here is the hormone traveling through the blood, okay? These target cells have to have these receptors in order to welcome the hormone. So let's say, for example, there's way too much hormone in circulation, right? So there's like an excess of hormone in circulation. Well, the target cell may not want all that hormone. So what the target cell will actually do is the target cell will downregulate or decrease how many receptors it has available for the hormone to bind. Then the hormone won't be able to act on the target cell and it's just going to keep going on its merry way. So then it won't have an action on the cell itself, okay? Now, what if the opposite happens and, you know, there is a deficiency of hormone in circulation? Then in that case, the target cells would want to increase how much receptors they have available 
basically upregulating the receptors. And that increases your chances of even more hormone binding to the target cells and acting upon them. So the target cells themselves can try to manipulate whether or not it has um, hormones acting upon it. Does that kind of make sense, guys? So hormone one increases and negative feedback results in hormone one reduction. Yes, if we're talking about negative feedback, yes. Does everybody understand the concepts of upregulating and downregulating the target cell receptors? Yes, I just have a quick question. No so are the hormones always being released or just released when they are triggered? They are only released when they are triggered, Leandro, which, yeah. is why it's, <laughs> which is why it's super important to understand the concept of the fact that you need to have something triggering it, whether it is another hormone or some kind of change in the blood or the nervous system got the trigger itself. Got it. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay. So here is a list of the different glands, the different hormones, what their actions are, and what's regulating it. So if we're going to put this in, you know, this type of question, systematic kind of um, events, you would say to yourself, okay, what is the gland, right? What is triggering the gland? So, right? So that would be what's regulating it, Okay what is the hormone that's released when it's triggered when it goes to its target cell what does it do so for example right we've been talking about the thyroid okay so we can say that the thyroid gland is stimulated by tsh which then makes it release t3 t4 which acts on distant cells to stimulate and maintain the metabolic basal rate or increase the overall basal metabolic rate. Does that make sense, guys? So essentially, what you want to do is kind of understand these concepts, because when we get into chapter 40, which are the disorders, the bottom line of your disorders is either that you have too much hormone, too little hormone, or the receptors where the hormone is supposed to bind don't work. So if I have too much thyroid hormone, I'm going to have an overexpression of my basal metabolic rate. If I have too little thyroid hormone, I'm going to have an underexpression of my basal metabolic rate. Does that make sense, guys? Another thing that you're going to want to know is whether or not they're protein-based or lipid-based, right? Because that will help you to understand how they travel in the blood. So the easiest way for you to study this is just to learn all of the steroid-based ones because there are only five of them. You know, if you know which ones are steroid-based, then all the other ones are basically protein-based. And that's an easier way than trying to remember all the protein-based ones and all the steroid-based ones. Just be like, oh, these are steroid-based, then obviously the rest are not. So that's, a, a, I guess, a, a quick way, way to study it. Okay. Another thing to think about is what is kind of like the action of the hormones and how do they act. So for example, if you have what's called a neurocrine hormones, these are basically hormones that are released into the blood via neurons, right? So, you know, like epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to be great examples of that. Majority of your hormones are secreted by the action of and like an Ooh, which means like I can't offer this. My laptop is broke, but I didn't get an email from her, so I'm pretty sure because like I didn't look away from the screen. I looked away like a couple times. Like we got people talking, but we've got her. Don't worry. Yeah, there we go. All right. So where was I? Uh, endocrine. If they're acting by an endocrine action, um you know, they're acting by traveling through the blood to a distant site, right? Some hormones act via like a paracrine action where they're basically just affecting a cell that's very close by. And then others act by what's called an autocrine action where they basically are acting upon themselves, okay? So this is just kind of thinking about like how the actual hormones are, are working. Another thing to be thinking of is whether or not they're water soluble or lipid soluble, like we talked about before. Majority of your hormones are peptides, so I would say majority of your hormones are water soluble, but you do have some steroid based hormones, which are lipid soluble. 
Another thing to think about, so much to think about, is that, you know, some hormones are actually derived from other hormones. So, for example, norepinephrine and epinephrine are derived from dopamine, which is one of the reasons why when patients have Parkinson's and they take L-DOPA for their Parkinson's, they have to take um, a combination drug. And that combination drug is usually called levodopa. And the reason why they take the dopamine, the L-DOPA and the um, levodopa in combination is because you want to maintain the half-life of the dopamine. Because if you don't, it may get converted to epinephrine and norepinephrine before it even gets to the blood-brain barrier. Does that kind of make sense, guys? Yeah. So, you know, when you think about the hormones, they may be derived from very um, from the same product or very similar products. Um, some of these um, hormones, when they're derived, they may be derived from like a water soluble or a lipid soluble um, aspect. So, like you have like you know water soluble tyrosine derived catecholamines like dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, and then you may have lip, um, those that are lipid soluble like you know um, T three T four, right? Now, something that is, you know, I guess interesting to know is that, you know, we have to maintain our cholesterol at all times, right? You don't want your plasma cholesterol to be too high, or you don't want your cholesterol in general to be too high, but you don't want to not have any cholesterol any at all because cholesterol is extremely important for actually making hormones, right? So it's important to maintain the balance of cholesterol, but the one thing you don't want to do is to, you know, have too much cholesterol for sure, but you definitely need some because how else are you going to make your sex hormones? How else are you going to make your glucocorticoids and your mineral corticoids? How else are you going to maintain the um, fluidity of the lipid bilayer? Right. I definitely do not want you to understand the chemistry. Um, this, you know, as much as you, we, I'm sure we all love biochem and orgo, that's not what we're here for. We're here for the fun side of it, not the, you know, chemistry side of it. So, but, um, yeah, <laughs> no, don't say that. Listen, don't, don't stress out about all of that. I just want you guys to understand these concepts, but you don't have to know the, these, the, um, the flow charts of these, um, the way the hormones are derived. No. But what you do need to understand, for example, is how these hormones are actually acting on their target cells. So for example, you have water-soluble hormones and you have lipid-soluble hormones, right? So your water-soluble hormones, because they're water-soluble, they can travel in the blood, dissolve in the plasma, just fine. But crossing over the lipid bilayer membrane is an issue, right? So instead, you have to have... Um, receptors that are found in the plasma membrane. So the hormone would bind to a receptor um, found on the plasma membrane and then trigger for some kind of cascade to occur within the cell to send messages inside the cell. So secondary messengers like cyclic AMP are going to be important to trigger cascades. Um, and these cascades are usually protein kinase cascades. So yes, let me... Let, Dan, don't go into a depressive state. I'm about to do a little bit of biochem, okay? But it's only to help you understand what's going on. So kinases, as you learned in biochem, right? Phosphorylate things, right? So when this whole action is occurring and the protein kinases are signaled, the idea is that they are going to phosphorylate different proteins, right? And phosphorylation is kind of like light switch action, turning on and off, the, the action of these proteins, which is exactly how hormones work, because a hormone is not going to let uh, a cell do something it wasn't doing before or couldn't do before. The idea is that it's going to either increase or decrease the activity of the cell. So when that hormone binds to that G protein receptor, and it signals the cascade for cyclic AMP to cause for protein kinase cascades, those kinases are either going to phosphorylate or dephosphorylate. Well, actually, they're going to phosphorylate because they're a kinase, right? And that's either going to turn on or off the action of what the cell was already doing. Does that make sense? Was that too much biochem or do you feel okay with that? So, you know, there are different protein receptors that are found on the cell membrane, right? <laughs> so, you know, it could be a G protein receptor, it could be a Jack receptor, but either way, these are 
receptors that are associated with water soluble hormones binding to the cell because that water soluble hormone can't cross the lipid bilayer unlike lipid soluble hormones right so lipid soluble hormones they have a problem traveling through the blood because they're lipid soluble so they have to hitch a ride on albumin you know like a little taxi cab protein but then when it gets to its target and it's released you know those receptors are usually found inside the cell either in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm because they can cross over the cell membrane easily because they're lipid soluble right and then once they bind to their um according receptor, they trigger, you know, transcription and translation of whatever protein that you want that's going to alter the activity of the cell. Because remember, that's how hormones work. They work to alter the activity of the cell, right? They're not letting the cell do anything it didn't want to do before or couldn't do before. So when you think about these hormones and when they're made, they're actually made in like a pre-hormone stage and then they're cleaved to maturity, right? So hormones are utilized a lot. So if they're constantly utilized, sometimes when you try to like, um, you know, take the concentration of the hormone that's found in the blood, it doesn't give you a very accurate representation because you might be utilizing that hormone at that moment. So what you can do is you can measure the cleavage fragment because this will be able to give you an idea of how much hormone was actually made, even if the mature portion of the hormone is constantly being used. Does that kind of make sense, guys? Okay, any questions so far? Okay, Olivia wants me to repeat that, no problem. So the idea is this, Olivia, right? So hormones have, so when you make a hormone, right? When a cell makes a hormone, it makes like it in a pre-hormone state and then it's cleaved or activated to become the mature hormone that you're gonna need, right? So what tends to happen with these hormones is that they're utilized. Like typically when you need a hormone, you make it and then you use it, right? And let's say you want to measure, like you want to do some kind of diagnostic testing and measure how much of that hormone is actually in the blood. What you would actually do is you could actually measure the cleavage fragment because the cleavage fragment was never used. It was made, but it was never used the hormone was utilized. So if I want like an accurate representation of how much hormone was made, I can measure how much cleavage fragment I have. And that can give me a better reading of how much hormone was actually made just in case this hormone is being utilized at the time. Does that make sense? Perfect. Okay. So remember, these hormones, they're like um, traveling to their distant sites, right? And, you know, one of, my, one, of, one of my students in my last class, you know, she was asking me, well, how does the hormone know where to go? And, you know, I say it all comes back to these receptors. You know, these receptors here are on the target cells. So, you know, some hormones are targeted to pretty much every cell. So, you know, like thyroxine, which is a thyroid hormone, he's going to have a receptor on pretty much every cell. But, you know, hormones like ACTH is only going to bind onto the adrenal gland. So it's, you know, the adrenal gland going to have specific hormones receptors for ACTH. That way, even if ACTH is traveling in the blood, it's only going to bind at the adrenal gland. Does that make sense? So here's another thing to think about. When water-soluble hormones are made, they're actually made and stored in vesicles until they're triggered to be released, right? Ah, see, Dan's thinking how I'm thinking right now. Okay, so if you are a water soluble hormone, right, you are made in your cell, then there is a cell membrane with a receptor, a hormone possibly binds, triggers for that already stored hormone to be released, and the little vesicle will travel to the plasma membrane basically become one with the plasma membrane and release the hormone via exocytosis. Does that make sense, guys? But if you are a lipid soluble hormone, you are formed on demand. Why would we not form you before you're needed and wait for the trigger? 
why is it that as a lipid soluble hormone, the trigger is what tells you to be synthesized and released? Why is that more beneficial if you are a lipid soluble hormone? What do you guys think? Not a limited supply of the transport protein. You know, the lipid hormone, the transport protein is only after it leaves the cell to get to its destination, Dan. We're talking about the hormone being made in that cell right now, right? So you're triggered to be released, okay? You are formed when you're triggered to be released. A water-soluble hormone doesn't have to be formed on demand. It can actually be formed previously and then wait until it gets its trigger to be released. But if you're a lipid-soluble hormone, you can't be formed before you get the trigger. Why? Why don't you think you can be formed? Stimulus for the hormone is required for triggering. Well, all hormones require a trigger, water soluble or not. But think about it. Ah, because if the cell is lipid soluble, if the hormone is lipid soluble, it's going to pass through the bilayer as soon as it's made. Then you're going to have this abundance of hormone when you don't even need it. So you've got to wait for the trigger because it's lipid soluble. Ah, see, I'm, I'm here to try to make things make sense. Okay, so this is what we're going to do for the rest of the time we're together. We are going to go through the different glands that you're going to be responsible for and their hormones, right? Like I said to you guys before, if you know what that hormone does, then its hyperactivity will make sense and its hypoactivity will make sense. Meaning if I have too much or too little of the hormone, I will understand what's going on. So the first hormone gland that we need to look at is the pituitary gland, right? The pituitary gland is an extremely important gland because it regulates a lot of the other glands that are um, a part of the endocrine system, okay? It used to be called the master gland, but it really isn't because the hypothalamus tells it to do. So the hypothalamus really is the big dog on campus, but the pituitary, it, it controls a lot of the other glands. So it tends to be very important. What's your question, Shannon? You want to take the mic? What's up? Yeah, before we moved on, I wanted to ask, I just wanted to reiterate, lipid soluble hormones are formed when triggered because if they were stored before, they would just pass through the lipid bilayer immediately. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You couldn't really store it. There would really be no way to store it. Yeah. All okay, right. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So let's take a look at um, the pituitary. What you'll notice here, it's actually two glands in one. You'll notice that the posterior pituitary is actually an extension of the brain. So it's made of neurons. And the anterior pituitary is actually a true gland because it's made of epithelial tissue. So when you're learning about the pituitary gland, you'll learn that it's composed of an adenohypophysis because adeno means gland. So the anterior portion is actually the glandular portion. And then the posterior is an extension of the brain. So it's considered to be the neurohypophysis because it's made of literally neurons. And it's connected to the hypothalamus via this hypothalamic stalk that we're going to see. So the anterior pituitary, because it's a true gland, it has cells there called tropic cells, which are actually used to synthesize and secrete new hormones. The posterior pituitary is actually not a glandular at all, and it actually doesn't make any hormones. It only stores them. So hormones are made in the hypothalamus, they travel to the posterior pituitary via fast axonal transportation, and then they stay there until nerve impulses trigger them to be released. So the posterior pituitary doesn't actually make any hormones. It just stores them until it's time for the release. The anterior pituitary, because it's a true gland, actually makes hormones. So it makes six hormones. And these six hormones are stimulated by what's called releasing and inhibiting hormones that actually come from the hypothalamus. So essentially, what we're looking at it, you know, what we're really looking at is this. Here is your hypothalamus, here is your posterior pituitary, and here's your anterior pituitary. In the hypothalamus, you make several different hormones. Some are known as releasing and inhibiting hormones. 
they travel through a portal system. Remember like how we had the portal system in the first unit? This is another portal system. They travel through the portal system, which is called the hypophysial portal vein, and it gets to the anterior pituitary where it can bind to different tropic cells, depending on which receptor is gonna be activated and trigger those cells to make hormone and release it into the wild. In the posterior pituitary, hormones are made in the hypothalamus. They travel to the posterior pituitary. They're stored until they're triggered for release. Okay, so when we're thinking about, on, change the slide real quick. When we're thinking about the anterior pituitary, we're thinking about a gland that is triggered by releasing and inhibiting hormones. Come back to my schematic. Every time you think of a gland, always think to yourself, what triggers it to secrete hormone? And what hormone does it secrete? And where is that hormone going? Any questions so far? Everybody's okay so far? So the posterior pituitary is more like a warehouse. Yeah, for sure. And the anterior pituitary is like a true production plant. Yeah. So the posterior pituitary is a warehouse and the anterior pituitary is a true endocrine gland, a true endocrine gland for sure. Yeah. That's a great way to think about it. So for example, in the posterior pituitary, you know, I always feel like when Dan asks me a question, I have like the next slide <laughs> to answer his question. <laughs> So, for example, in the posterior pituitary, you have what's called the paraventricular nucleus, which makes the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin travels down the axons stored in the posterior pituitary, right? And when that baby is coming, okay, it nervous system triggers the posterior pituitary to release oxytocin to travel to the uterine muscles so that you can dilate. The supraoptic nuclei makes a hormone known as ADH. That travels to the posterior pituitary. And whenever your blood volume gets to be too low or your blood pressure gets to be too low, that triggers the release of ADH from the posterior pituitary. And it travels to the kidneys to help you to retain water. Does that make sense, guys? So in the posterior pituitary, there is no making, just storing, like a little warehouse. So overall, the anterior pituitary, you've got these hormones that are made there. And in the posterior pituitary, you've got these hormones that are stored there until release. So this is a slide. And I mean, I, I kind of, sometimes I really miss being in the classroom sometimes, right? Because whenever I used to put this slide up, I would just see the student's face go like, holy shit. <laughs> and then I'd be like, no, guys, it's going to be okay. Don't worry. You know, but I can't see you guys' faces. So I have no idea, you know, how you feel about this slide. But I'm going to break this slide down for you. So the idea is that you have a gland. Something triggers it to be, to release hormone. And then that hormone is secreted. Okay. So. The cells of the anterior pituitary are known as tropic cells, right? You've got corticotropes, thyrotropes, gonadotropes, somatotropes, and lactotropes. Yeah, believe me, Leandra, I can see your face right now. I miss it. <laughs> so the way it would work is this. The hypothalamus, okay, is important for making and, and secreting what's called releasing and inhibiting hormones, okay? So let's go back to the thyroid as our example again, because that's the initial example we used. Thyrotropin releasing hormone, or TRH, is made in the hypothalamus, right? It travels via the portal system to the anterior pituitary, where it binds to tropic cells known as thyrotropes. Those thyrotropes are going to make and release a hormone known as TSH. Why is this not writing? Okay, so here we have hormone trigger another hormone for release. So TSH is now going to travel to the thyroid. So here you have another hormone 
released to trigger another gland. And when it gets to the thyroid, it binds to the thyroid receptor or the TSH receptor on the thyroid. TSH will bind. And then the thyroid will release T3 and T4. Do you see how that works, guys? Same holds true if it was a corticotrope. Corticotroping releasing hormone would come from the hypothalamus. It would travel to the corticotrope where it would bind and make that corticotrope synthesize and release adrenocorticotropic hormone. ACTH would make its way to the adrenal gland where it would bind to the receptor and make the adrenal gland release cortisol. Same kind of flow. Does that make sense, guys? So it's basically a cascade, Dan. And you know what? I'm so happy that you said that because you're going to see how this cascade of events basically just depicts the entire unit. Okay? So, oh yeah, this is like a fun unit. Come on, man. Where's the enthusiasm? All right. So does everybody kind of like feel a little bit better about this uh, chart? You don't have to know the names of the receptors, but you do have to, you do have to know the different corticotropes and what hormones are going to trigger each part of the flow. But you don't have to know the name of the receptor. Like you don't need to know that the TSH receptor is a G-link GPCR. Like you don't need to know that. This is not biochem. Okay. All right. So this is a, pretty much the same chart. You know, it's telling you that either you have a releasing or, a or inhibiting hormone acting upon a particular tropic cell and releasing a particular tropic hormone. So it's just another way to kind of get you guys' brain moving. So remember, if you are within the anterior pituitary, you've got tropic cells and you are stimulated by releasing and inhibiting hormones coming down from the portal system, from the hypothalamus to trigger you. If you're in the posterior pituitary, you don't have any tropic cells. You don't have any cells that are going to synthesize any hormone. You're just basically a warehouse storing oxytocin or ADH and then a particular trigger is occurring and that is going to cause the release of the hormone from the posterior pituitary. So essentially, right, if you are a posterior pituitary hormone, right, you travel via fast axonal transportation and then you're eventually released into the blood. If you're anterior pituitary, you come down the portal system and you find your tropic cell. And how do you find it? There is a receptor for it on there. Okay. And then that tropic cell will release the tropic hormone to travel out to the, to the body. So oxytocin is basically the hormone that's going to act on your uterine muscles to increase dilation. And it will also act on your mammary glands once, you know, to get you ready for this baby that's about to come. ADH is your antidiuretic hormone that acts on your kidney tubules, right? And it has you bring water back. So ADH is your antidiuretic hormone. I also call it the tap water hormone because it only brings back water from the kidneys. Oh, shoot. This arrow disappeared. You guys should have an arrow. Okay. So the way how, do you guys know how ADH works? So antidiuretic hormone works by traveling through the blood because it's water soluble. It's going to bind to receptors on the kidney tubules, right? Because it's water soluble. So here's a G protein receptor. It's going to cause for a signal cascade via cyclic AMP. And it's going to cause for aquaporins to be made. Aquaporins are water channels that will basically insert on the lumen side of the kidney tubules and force water to come back from the urine that's being made into the blood. What is that going to do? That's going to increase our blood volume, therefore increasing our blood pressure. Everybody's okay with that? So a great way to put this into practice is understanding what antidiuretic hormone does. So diuretic means lose fluid. Anti means opposite. So antidiuretic hormone makes you not lose a lot of fluid. So here's a great way to remember it. 
when you go drinking with your friends and not drinking Kool-Aid, drinking the other kind of Kool-Aid, right? The one that involves alcohol. What is the thing that you have to do when you've drank copious amounts of alcohol? What do you have to do? Yes, Ryan, you have to pee or urinate, okay? So antidiuretic hormone is actually, <laughs> I like it, micturates. That's a good one, Dan. <laughs> so antidiuretic hormone is actually inhibited by alcohol. So the more alcohol you drink, the more ADH you inhibit its action. So if I inhibit the action of ADH because I've drank too much champagne, what's going to end up happening is ADH won't be able to bind to the receptor and I won't be able to pull fluid back, which means that I keep adding fluid to my urine, increasing my urine volume, therefore having you having to go to the bathroom and urinate several times when you drank a lot of alcohol. Does that kind of make sense, guys? So don't break the seal. Okay, Christian. <laughs> so let's put this in a patho kind of standpoint, right? If we're thinking about patho, the way we need to think about it is this. If you have a decrease in your ADH activity, you suffer from something called diabetes insipidus. So diabetes means overflow. So in this case, you're having an overflow of fluid. Okay. So essentially, right, when you have a decrease in your ADH activity, it's either because you're not releasing ADH from the posterior pituitary or those receptors here on the kidney tubules aren't working. So let's think about this. If I don't have enough ADH being released from the posterior pituitary, I won't have ADH to bind to the receptor. I won't be able to bring back water, right? So maybe you've got a fungal infection and it destroyed your posterior pituitary, or maybe you fell and hit your head and you destroyed your posterior pituitary. And now as a result of that, you're not releasing ADH and you can't pull water back. On a regular day, you normally probably urinate about a liter of fluid. On a day where your ADH is not functioning, you're probably going to lose about 20 liters of fluid. So with 20 liters of fluid being lost, you can start thinking to yourself, what are some clinical manifestations associated with such severe dehydration? What do you guys think is going to happen to this patient? Do you see what I'm saying here, guys? Another example of why you may end up with a diabetes insipidus is you may be making ADH just fine, but if the kidney receptors are unresponsive, it doesn't matter how much ADH you make, there's nothing for it to bind to, or even if it binds, it's not sensitive enough to trigger the aquaporin in order to actually get the water to come back. So essentially, your diabetes insipidus could either be neurogenic, meaning that something is going on with the back of the pituitary, or nephrogenic, because nephro means kidney, something is going on with the kidneys in terms of the receptors on the kidneys. Does that make sense, guys? So to answer Dan's patient, when a patient is described diuretics for um, high blood pressure, the do the drugs um, stop the formation of aquaporins? Um, so some of them actually do act upon... Um, some of them do act upon the, ki the kidney tubules itself, but usually they are acting um, via a different pathway and they're acting via like um, a pathway that is usually triggered through aldosterone. So how do you guys feel <clears throat> about what we just spoke about? Everybody's okay. Yeah. So let's go back to only only let's go back to Dan's question one more time. So high blood pressure medication is very complicated, right? And you know, we're actually gonna see the renin pathway in a little bit here. So there are some drugs that so I don't want to say that no drug block aquaporin because some of them are actually um, used to block the different aquaporins as a way of like manipulating the, how the aquaporins work, but a lot of them are mostly um, like manipulating the renin pathway itself. But um, inhibition of aquaporins is something that is definitely done as well. So it's like a combination. It depends on the type of um, aquaporin. I'm sorry, it depends on the type of um, diuretic. Okay. So here we go. 
So overall, you know, in we're in talking about the anterior pituitary, you've got all these different hormones, and then you've got um, their different targets. So really try to get to know them, you know, because if you understand what the hormone does, where it goes, it's really easy to kind of understand what happens when it goes haywire. Okay. All right. So... What about the thyroid? We've talked about it several times today. So, the, so, okay, before I do that, can I move on from the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary? I don't want to move on if nobody is ready. Okay, perfect. All right. So um, the thyroid is this butterfly-shaped gland. It's found in the anterior portion of the neck, and um, it is important for, like we said before, body energy requirements, right? Kind of like, you know, being able to manipulate your basal metabolic rate. Now, the thyroid, there are three types of thyroid hormones. There are your um, thyroxine and your um, triadiathyronine, which is your T3 and your, three, your T4. Um, those thyroid hormones are made from tyrosine and iodine right? Which is one of the reasons why if you don't have enough iodine, you have um, thyroid deficiencies because iodine is important for developing the thyroid in the womb and also for um, functioning of the thyroid itself to make thyroid hormone. But here in the US, we don't have that problem because pretty much everything is iodinized in terms of like salt based. You know, the salt, if you go to the supermarket, you'll see that the salt says iodinized salt, right? Um, and we get as much iodine as we need here in the U.S. from our diet. Uh, know the names. You don't have to spell them, though, because it's multiple choice, right? But I wouldn't give, like, um, it's, it won't be like a spelling test. You'll be able to realize which one is T3 and T4 on the test. So let's see here. Yeah, they're easy enough. So the three hormones are T3, T4, and calcitonin. So I would say the two most important are these two. And then calcitonin is released whenever there is too much calcium in the blood and you want to store calcium in the bones. Okay. So um, majority of your thyroid hormone that you find circulating in the blood is actually T4. And the reason why is because T3 is active and um, cons consistently being utilized and T3 is kind of made from T4. So you'll tend to see T4 in the blood circulating more. So, you know, if they do like a, a thyroid hormone test, they're usually going to test for the presence of T4, not so much the presence of T3. So within the thyroid, you have these follicles that produce um, a protein known as thyroglobulin. And thyroglobulin attaches to your iodine molecules and goes on to make the thyroid hormone, okay? So essentially, your thyroid hormone is important for your increasing your basal metabolic rate, basically utilizing your oxygen for cellular respiration to make ATP, right? Um, and, you know... Remember, the more you metabolize, the more heat you give off, okay? Calcitonin is responsible for lowering your blood calcium levels and storing calcium in the bone. So if we're really trying to like put everything together that we've been doing right now, you'll see that TSH will bind to the TSH receptor. That's going to trigger the thyroglobulin with the T3, T4 that's attached to get ready to be released. And then T3 and T4 are gonna be released into the blood and travel to the different cells in order to increase your overall base cell metabolic rate. And this is happening all day, every day. So this already tells us that if I don't have enough TSH, I won't be able to release enough T3, T4. Or if my TSH receptor is being stimulated too much, I'm gonna release too much T3, T4. Does that make sense, guys? So let's talk about this in terms of the negative feedback. Let's put everything together. So you have a gland. Something triggers that gland to release. And then it has a target. And at this target, it does whatever it needs to do. So let's say that your T4 levels are low in the blood. Because of 
um, negative feedback and bringing things back to homeostasis, that's going to send a message to the anterior pituitary saying, hey, can you increase your TSH levels so that TSH can travel to the thyroid and trigger it to release more T3, T4 and increase T4 in the blood? Does that make sense, guys? It will also send a message to the hypothalamus saying, hey, can you release TRH? Because if you release TRH, it will travel to the anterior pituitary, which will cause for TSH to increase, which will travel to the adrenal, not adrenal gland, the thyroid, which will cause my T4 to increase. Does that make sense, guys? Everybody's okay? Yes, let's repeat it. So the idea is that, remember, we've got this little flow chart going, right? So the idea is if T4 decreases in the blood, that's going to send a message to the hypothalamus saying increase TRH so it can travel to the anterior pituitary to increase TSH so it can travel to the thyroid to increase my T4 levels. Yeah. And then it doesn't even have to go all the way to the hypothalamus. It can stop at the hype at the adrenal. Why do I keep saying adrenal gland? It can stop at the anterior pituitary and ask the anterior pituitary to increase TSH so that it can increase T4 production at the thyroid. So if you look here at the flow chart, you'll see that that decrease in the T4 levels, right? can do a stop off at the anterior or a stop off at the hypothalamus. But either way, we're trying to increase this flow. Does that make sense? Perfect. Okay, so here's another guy. He's the parathyroid gland. The parathyroid glands, they're found on the back of the thyroid, okay? Their goal in life is to increase um, calcium in the blood and decrease phosphate in the blood, right? So it increases calcium in the blood by um, either doing resorption via osteoclast or having the kidney reabsorb more calcium when it's after it's filtered the blood um, and, you know, stimulate vitamin D production. So bottom line is this, you have a balance that calcium is supposed to be at. If it falls below that level, the parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone increases, travels to the bone, tells the osteoclast to eat away at the bone so calcium levels begin to rise in the blood, bringing us back to homeostasis. Everybody's okay with that? If calcium levels get to be too high, the thyroid releases calcitonin, which tells the calcium in the blood to go into the bones to be stored, which decreases calcium in the blood, bringing us back to homeostasis. Does that make sense, guys? Everybody's okay? So let's say someone has a tumor on their parathyroid gland, and now they're making way too much parathyroid hormone. What's that going to do for the patient? What do you guys think? Ah, and you guys are right, right? It's going to cause for the osteoclast to eat away at the bones so much that the bones become weak and brittle. So maybe osteopenia, maybe osteoporosis. And now the calcium levels are going to be so high in the blood that they're going to start affecting everything else, right? Because remember, calcium is important for nervous system impulses and transactions and actions, right? Or actions in the gut. So you start to see a slew of manifestations because the calcium levels have risen too much. Very good. Professor, I have a question before yeah. we move on. So if the levels are, if we have too much parathyroid hormone mm -hmm. and like it's basically causing osteoporosis yeah. and raising the calcium in the blood, mm -hmm. wouldn't calcitonin just react and then deposit it back in the bone? Or is you, this just all too damaging for it? You would think, right? But you have to remember that for one, calcitonin isn't really a main guy. And for two, this is a 
this is a tumor making it secrete way more than it's supposed to. So even if calcitonin kicks in, it's only going to be doing like this much work. Okay. So it can't keep up anyway. Exactly. So what you're okay. going to do is literally remove the tumor. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Awesome. All right. But you guys are thinking, you're thinking about chapter 40 already because we learned all about that in chapter 40. Okay, so then the adrenal gland is kind of like two glands in one, right? It's epithelial tissue on the cortex and um, nervous tissue in the medulla, kind of like the pituitary being two glands in one, right? So the cortex regulates um, salt, sugar, and sex. So your mineral corticoids for salt, your glucocorticoids for sugar, and your androgens for sex. And then the medulla regulates your epinephrine and your norepinephrine, right? So overall, what's happening is this. Okay, anytime you have any kind of biological stress, that's going to send a message via the nervous system to the adrenal medulla and say, hey, I'm going to need some epinephrine to make it through this day. Okay, or if you need some mineral corticoids or glucocorticoids, right, the cortex will be pulled into action. So, for example, you know, if you need cortisol to be increased, because, you know, every day is a very stressful day, right? You wake up, cortisol needs to begin to rise in the blood. Okay. So how does it rise? The stress of waking up <laughs> and knowing that we have to go through another day causes for um, the, the CRH releasing hormone to trigger ACTH to be released from the anterior pituitary, which is adrenal corticotropic hormone, which travels to the adrenal gland and has the adrenal cortex release cortisol. And then cortisol is supposedly supposed to help us through the day. Right. So yes, triple S is how people remember it, Alejandro. And, um, you know, there are lots of mnemonics out there to help you guys, some of which I will not speak about in class. So you have your three zones, right? Make sure you know the different zones and what they release. So glomerulosa releases aldosterone, fasciculata releases cortisol, reticularis releases the androgens themselves. So we're going to spend a good amount of time talking about, um, you know, bringing back salt, bringing back water, things like that. So I want to ask you guys, um, I know if you took Path 01 with me, you are sick of the running system. <laughs> but if you didn't take Path 01 with me, you may not have been drilled into you. <laughs> but <laughs> you're not supposed to agree with me, Dan. It's not okay. <laughs> but if you did not take Path 01 with me, do you want to have a little bit of a review of how the renin angiotensin aldosterone system works? I'm pretty sure everyone that took Path 1 with me is like, hell no, I do not want to see that shit ever again. But here we go. I kept telling you, you're always going to see it, right? <laughs> so let's do a little bit of a review, okay? So whenever your blood flow is low or your blood volume is low, your kidneys realize that. And they know that because all the blood travels through the kidneys. So whenever the blood flow or the blood volume is low, renin is released. So renin is released from the kidney cells and a protein known as angiotensinogen is actually, renin will convert it to something called angiotensin 1. Now angiotensin 1, he's all right, you know, but he's not really that strong of a dude. So he travels through the blood into the lungs and the converting enzyme known as ACE converts it to angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin 2, he's the big dog on campus. He does things like increase your sympathetic nervous activity, which will cause your heart to beat faster, which will cause you to increase your blood flow, right? It goes to the adrenal gland and says, hey, adrenal gland, you need to release aldosterone. Aldosterone is your salt water hormone it's gonna bring back salt from the kidneys and water always follows salt. So when the salt comes back, the water follows. That's gonna increase your blood flow, your blood volume, and therefore your blood pressure. Another thing that it, angiotensin II will do is it will go to the posterior pituitary, knock on the door and go, hey, can, you know, can, I, can I borrow some ADH? And then ADH will travel to the kidneys and bring back water. Because remember, ADH is your tap water hormone. It brings back water. And then aldosterone is your salt water hormone. It brings back salt and water. And then angiotensin II also travels to your blood vessels and constricts them right, in an effort to try to raise your blood pressure. So overall, angiotensin II does a myriad of, um, of things to try to increase your blood volume and your blood pressure totally. But we are talking about the adrenal gland here. So what ends up happening is when your blood volume is low or your 
salt concentration in the blood is low or your blood pressure is low, the kidneys recognize that, puts the renin pathway into go, angiotensin II travels to the adrenal gland, has it release aldosterone, and then aldosterone will act on the kidney tubules to bring back salt and bring back water. So essentially, if you have um, an adrenal cortex issue, you may, and it affects the zone that is secreting aldosterone, either you're going to be bringing back too much salt into the blood or excreting too much salt in the urine. Does that make sense, guys? Everybody's okay with that? Any questions? Take the mic, Dan. Take the mic. Okay. So when you're saying, <clears throat> excuse me, if you could go back to that previous slide. Absolutely. So when you're saying, oh crap, I forgot my question. So let me let me try to remember this and I'll I'll jump back when I'm ready. <laughs> okay, we'll be here till 2:45 at least. Okay. So, all right. So I'm I'm gonna leave aldosterone and I'm gonna go to cortisol. Cortisol is or get ready for the day hormone, right? Um, its prime effect is gluconeogenesis, which is making glucose from something other than a carbohydrate, which means that it's really just giving you the energy to get ready to face the day. It also has other effects like lipolysis, which is breaking down fats, and it also has anti-inflammatory effects. So for example, when you have a rash and you go to the CVS and you buy cortisone, what you're really buying is like synthetic cortisol to depress your immune system and stop the inflammatory reaction. So cortisol is what gets us ready for the day. It increases in the morning and it kind of peters off in the afternoon. But it's interesting because, you know, I hate teaching nine o'clock classes because my students aren't awake yet. But essentially, you guys are supposed to have your peak of cortisol at nine o'clock. So I'm not entirely sure <laughs> why the class is like so, you know, tired. But, you know, you really see um, the cortisol fall in the day. Like if I have a 4.30 class, um, that is the depression, Diana. Tell me about it. <laughs> I feel the depression, and trust me. When I have a 4.30 class in the afternoon, I can absolutely see the cortisol falling in the students. Like I, I, when, I, when I teach a 4.30 class, I'm like, yeah, these people, they're not going to make it to quarter to six. <laughs> you do not stay up late studying pathos. Stop it. Anyway, so here are all the effects of cortisol. My advice to you, you know, it's a lot of effects. If you try to memorize all these effects, you're screwed. What you could do is memorize it in, in like, or understand it in like groups, you know? So it's important for metabolism. It's important for blood pressure. You know, um, it has inflammatory responses, but most importantly, it increases gluconeogenesis. You know what I'm saying? So if you understand the function of cortisol, when we get into chapter 40 and you start seeing the effects of too much cortisol or too little cortisol, it starts to make sense. So for example, if you have a disorder where you have too much cortisol, then clearly you're going to be making too much glucose, right? Via gluconeogenesis. So that already tells me that one of the major manifestations of an increase in cortisol is high blood glucose. Do you see what I'm saying here, guys? So that's how you kind of need to think about it. So as we approach the next chapter, right, we are going to be looking at different endocrine diseases, and they're either going to be classified by not enough action of the hormone, too much action of the hormone, or the target cell not responding any at all. So for example, right, you either have a hypo, uh, well, this is what I want to do, actually. You either have a primary hyposecretion, secondary hyposecretion, or a primary or secondary hypersecretion, or the target cells don't respond. So essentially, let me do this one first. No matter how much hormone I have, if my receptors are insensitive, then it would be like I didn't have the hormone to begin with. So it would reflect like I lack the hormone. So I would basically have a hypoactivity or a hyporesponsiveness of that hormone. Does that make sense? So I could have a hypothyroidism if all of my thyroid receptors were not working, even if I was making thyroid hormone. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. But what about hyposecretion and hypersecretion versus primary or secondary? Okay. So let's do this. So. 
let's say this is my hypothalamus, this is my anterior pituitary, and this is my primary endocrine gland, okay? So this is primary, that's secondary, that's tertiary, okay? So let's go back to the thyroid again. So let's say that this is the thyroid, right? So the thyroid makes T3 and T4, okay? So if you have a disorder where the actual thyroid is screwed up, let's say you've got Graves' disease. In Graves, the thyroid is too hyperactive because the TSH receptor is being stimulated too much by autoantibodies. It causes for the T4 to rise and the T3 to rise too much. But it's a primary hypersecretion because it's the primary organ that's all screwed up. Due to negative feedback, if my T4 levels become too high, what's going to happen to my TSH levels? Are they going to fall or are they going to rise? What do you guys think? They're going to fall. Exactly, right? So in a primary endocrine disorder of the thyroid, the T4 levels are high, but the TSH levels are low. Okay? But what if it was a secondary disorder? Well, the secondary disorder would mean that something upstream of your primary gland is the issue. So for example, maybe you've got some kind of um, tumor that's causing the, adrenal, the anterior pituitary to secrete too much TSH. If it secretes too much TSH, how is that going to act on the, on the thyroid? It's going to cause the, the thyroid to do what with the thyroid hormone? Increase or decrease? Increase. Exactly. So in a secondary hypersecretion, the TSH is high, making the T4 high. And if it was primary, the T4 would be high, but due to negative feedback, because there's nothing wrong with the um, anterior pituitary, the TSH would be low. Does that make sense? Does that make sense, guys? The same is true if it's um, hyposecretion, right? Because if it's a, I'm going to do the eraser and try to erase this here. If it's a um, hyposecretion, the T4 would be low. Like let's say you got Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's is an autoimmune disease that destroys the actual thyroid. So the actual thyroid is destroyed. So that primary gland is destroyed. So the T4 is low. What's going to happen is negative feedback is going to cause the anterior pituitary to do what? increase my TSH to try to get the thyroid to make more thyroid hormone, okay? So in a primary hyposecretion of the thyroid, T4 is low, but TSH is high. If it was secondary, what would happen? What would my TSH look like if it was a secondary disorder? My TSH would be what? It would be low, therefore making my T4 levels low. Does that make sense, guys? So in a primary disorder, the actual primary gland is disrupted. In a secondary disorder, anything upstream of it is what's causing the problem. But we'll see this over and over again um, when we do chapter 40. So even if you feel kind of confused about it now, we're, we're going to do it so much when we do chapter 40 that you'll be good at it. All right. Any questions? So with both primary disorders, you have opposed responses. Yes, due to the negative feedback then. Yes, because in a primary disorder, the actual primary gland is the issue, right? What is upstream of it, because the body always wants to compensate, is going to try to compensate for the issue the primary gland is having. So it would be the opposite response. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, I will see you guys back here on Monday where we will tackle chapter 40 for the whole entire week and it will be all gravy. I will try to get these um, emails out and um, meetings with these students done. So hopefully I can release the grades by tomorrow. All right. I will see you guys next week. Take care of yourselves.